Good idea. More water. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to yet another cracking edition of the Matt Brown Show. This is the Secrets of Fail series where we are talking to CEOs and entrepreneurs all about their epic business failures uh, and everything they learn from it. And with us in the line or on, in the hot seat today and on the line is none other than Peter Duncan. He is the CEO and founder of a company called Micro Seismic. Uh, Peter, welcome to the show. It's nice to be here, mate. Matt. Thank Perfect. you very much. Mates, Matt's all good. Same thing. Matt, you bet. <laughs> uh, all right, great. So let's get into the elevator pitch. Um, what exactly are you guys up to there at MicroSeismic? So at MicroSeismic, we're an energy mining and environmental services business. And the service we provide is passive seismic listening to monitor a company's assets or their activities. Um, we do that monitoring to assure the efficacy, uh, the effectiveness of that activity or to protect their assets from geologic hazards that might be fault movements you'd call that an earthquake or sinkhole development that sort of thing we monitor to make sure that they do their business right and that their business stays in place so who are your customers typically are they mining uh, customers or are they kind of you know manufacturing so all of the above really now our principal business we grew out grew up as an oil service business and so our principal clients were oil companies who were uh, operating wells and fields and developing oil and gas assets but with the transition over the last few years we've moved into doing co2 sequestration which uh, where our business there is people who are putting co2 in the ground and mining companies who have assets that can be subject to geologic accidents or failures we monitor to give them early warning of what's happening. So you're like, for what I'm hearing at least, you're like the insurance policy that they didn't know they needed or that they couldn't buy from someone else, but they needed to protect their kind of infrastructure. Well, you know, you're spot on. And it's often I use that analogy with clients when we're talking to them. They say, well, I've not had something bad happen. And I said, yes, but you buy fire insurance anyway, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got you now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, look, um, amazing business. Very, very interesting. I haven't heard about anything like that. So you're super special and different. So uh, you guys are clearly doing something very unique uh, and innovative there. Uh, but uh, Peter, let's get into the meat and the potatoes of this episode. Uh, what is your epic story of failure for our audience around the world today? Well, sure. So if you'd asked me 10 years ago, or maybe even five, what my elevator pitch was, I would say we are a hydraulic fracture monitoring company, a frack monitoring company. And our business grew up, um, our business was to go with oil and gas companies to where they were developing unconventional reservoirs and to monitor their fracking to make sure that they made a better well. When I started the company in 2003 to do passive seismic, I considered all the things that passive seismic might contribute to in the world, earthquake monitoring, monitoring of fluid flow in, in subterranean reservoirs, things like that. And I said, I'm going to do everything except hydraulic fracture monitoring because there are other people who do that. Well, it turned out that my technology, as we developed it, became particularly uh, appropriate to the unconventional reservoirs that were being developed and the shale gale took off and for us it was like drinking from a fire hose and we got trapped by success into becoming a one trick pony hydraulic fracturing and we grew like crazy we grew from starting in my spare bedroom to having 250 employees and doing business around the world and attracting private equity investment and all of that it seemed like there was no end we were on the road to doing an ipo and then the oil business changed number one the engineers started to figure out how to frack the reservoirs to make a better well and two the markets made the oil businesses change from a growth business to a value business. So the oil companies were no longer rewarded for adding reserves 
to their tank. That's that's the way they used to be rewarded. Their stock value was set on replacing and increasing their reserves. No, they were now being valued on returning money to their stockholders, which meant they stopped spending money on science and they stopped spending money on me. And so about 2015, 2016, our business started to go down. Uh, we were principally, while we were around the world, we were principally domestic U.S. and the domestic oil companies in the U.S. stopped spending money on frac monitoring. And then COVID hit and we couldn't go into the field anywhere anyway. And we went from 250 employees to five employees uh, that, and I wasn't one of them, by the way. I. I I guess what we'd say is 245 of us took a salary holiday, which is a euphemism for getting laid off. Uh, but the business has come back and we are now moving forward, growing. We're back to about 50 employees and things have changed, but maybe that's the subject of the rest of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Peter. Um, so when you think about that whole experience, which must have completely sucked, <laughs> uh, I mean, to have like, I mean, honestly, dude, like when I hear stories like that, it's, it's why I do this particular series because it's like there's going to be epic lessons here. Um, and so just to, before you uh, ask you the question, though, like one of the things I'm a great believer in is is like my business also went on a similar trajectory where we just built the best operating model. And I, I did a, a, a episode on Secrets of Fail about this. But we just, you know, doubled revenues every year and we were like the glamour kid. And I spoke down, I sat to my, uh, down with my mentor here and it's like hundreds of businesses. And I said to him, listen, you know, I've got my opportunity to move to the States. What should I do? And he's like, no, sell it. And I'm like, I'm not selling it. You know, we've been doubling revenues every year. Same thing with you, you know, like you went from like to 250 really quick. You would just like, you hit the thing and then you PE and all that kind of stuff. It would have been, I imagine if you look back on that, it would, it, for me, it would have, I would regret not exiting. Do you know what I mean? Well, you know, that's a really, I didn't build this company to make a company. I built this company as a project with the idea of exiting. Yeah. And uh, we got the proverbial knock on the door when we were on the big hockey stick rise, the, when we were rising in the right direction. We got the knock on the door and expected to exit to a strategic, uh, one of the big service companies. And instead, we got a bigger valuation, a bigger offer from the private equity firm. Ah, but the private equity firm also says, but we'll only buy 50% of you and we'll give you that chance for the second bite of the apple. Mm. Well, then before we managed to bite that apple a second time, the market changed as it does. And as your mentor suggested, um, if you have a chance, perhaps the exit would have been the thing to do. We held on and now we kind of have once we got into that down cycle, we sort of had those golden handcuffs. Mm. That second bite of the apple was just out there around the corner and we we held on to see where it would go. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it, is, it is always hindsight. So with that said, uh, Peter, when you think about that whole experience, what stands out for you as a kind of a key lesson um, that you now take forward with you into your business today? So... We, as we built the company, we had time and time again opportunities to expand, to, to move into different markets, if you like, and always felt that we needed to maintain our focus on the market that we knew. And we expanded globally in the same market, but we didn't go outside hydraulic fracture monitoring that was where we were developing our expertise, where we had expanded our offering in terms of the breadth of that offering, and we were expanding globally, but we were focused on that hydraulic fracture market. And it went away. We weren't expecting it to go away, at least not as quickly as it did. Um, and what saved us is we've had Black Swan come in. We actually had a mining company approach us in 2018 with a significant problem that after some thought, we found we could tweak our technology to make it appropriate to that. And that saved our bacon. And that we've now, we're now growing that business. And then on top of that came the sequestration, the CCUS sequestration business, where our technology, once again, with a slight tweak, is appropriate. And we've been 
getting some work in that direction, and that's what's causing it. We still have a little bit of hydraulic fracture monitoring. There's a business there, although it's more directed at keeping people's wells from shearing off and failing rather than making a better well, finding more oil and gas. It's more protecting their asset there in their wells. But we're now protecting mining companies' assets, and we're going to protect the CO2 sequestration assets. And that whole business uh, moving into different offerings that are appropriate to our technology is what has saved us. So what's the lesson? Yes, focus on your core strengths. Yes, do what you... We didn't get drawn into doing other kinds of monitoring. We're sticking with passive seismic. But do be cognizant of what other market opportunities are there for you and move into them carefully, but consistently. Mm. Yeah, it's really good advice. And Peter, if you could get into the Matt Brown show time machine and, and kind of, you know, go back in time to when you were having this bull run, so to speak, what advice would you, um, well, what would you do differently, let's say that, uh, and why, would now, now knowing what you now know? So I think you've already referenced what we should have done, and that is exit when we had the chance in 2010. That would have been good because we, we would have done that, well, and it would be somebody else's problem, Matt, rather than mine. I'd be off fishing. But so perhaps exit when you have the chance and uh, don't be greedy. Um, but the second thing is, while I really am a firm believer in focusing on your core strengths, I think be a little bit more aware of where you can take those core strengths into other parallel businesses. It's still seismic. I'm still a geophysicist, but there were other opportunities that we could have moved into earlier uh, that would have taken some investment, would have taken some cycles in our in our intellectual group, but would have probably been good insurance against what happened to us in 2020. Mm. Yeah, just crazy, man. Tell me, uh, Peter, what's your advice to other CEOs uh, and entrepreneurs today about, you know, the importance of failing or failure in becoming successful in business? Well, I think if you don't, um, if you don't ship your product and take risks, then you, you'll never have a product. So I have to say, when we got into the frack monitoring business, you, you remember I said, the one thing I wasn't going to do is frack monitoring and then the shale gale came along and I got hauled into it. And when we first did our frack monitoring business, when someone called us up and said, would you go do this? I didn't even know how to spell fracking. And I would say we probably did a hundred well monitors. We monitored a hundred frack jobs before we really knew what we were doing. So if I were to, if I were to tell you all the failures we did in those early days, you would say it's amazing that you kept in business. But what we said, we're not going to fail. We're just going to keep trying and because we believe in what we're doing. So I would say, yes, believe in what you're doing. Listen to the market. Let them tell you what you should be doing, but don't be afraid to try. Mm. It's, it's really sage advice, sage advice. Um, and Peter, when you think about books and tools and uh, other resources and things like that, what do you recommend to other CEOs today about, you know, in terms of books, tools, resources, to just to help them uh, become successful? So I think the, the, the Collins books on the, the habits of successful people is a good place to start. But one thing I have taken a lot of uh, guidance from actually is a fellow named Seth Godin. I don't know if you yeah, know Seth. Yeah. Uh, I read his blog every day. I often, in fact, today, one of his blogs was relevant to something that's going on in our business, and I sent it around to all of my people. So uh, I would say he has been an, an important influence on my development. And then I've had a board of directors, uh, some of the venture capital guys who came in, um, and then the private equity guys. And uh, this is my first startup. And in a previous life with a partner, um, he said, my partner, who was a bit of a mentor, he advised me that money is easy to find. Good money is hard to find. Take your time and find good money. And with by that, he meant 
money that comes with someone who's going to give you a good advice and listen to that advice. Mm. I've been fortunate to have good mentors throughout, well, all of my startups, but this one in particular. Mm-hmm. Amazing, uh, Peter. Great, incredible story. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it just you know, it, it's inspiring to see how you persevered through all of this, right? And you turned things around. Um, and that's what entrepreneurship for me is largely about. It's like eighty percent of success is just pitching up every day and carrying on, right? So um, it is. It is. It is. And, and finding the right team mm-hmm. to be with you, mm-hmm. finding people who are willing to go that extra distance and not give up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, uh, Peter, that does conclude uh, your time in the hot seat. I uh, appreciate you for being on the show. What an incredible story. Um, stick around. And uh, everybody else, we will see you all again soon. Cheers. Thanks, Matt.